We welcome you to Camp Creek this morning. We are glad you're here. Jeremy, can you get the CD for me? <laughs> Thank you. We are glad you're here. Without further ado, I just want to worship the Lord this morning. And I'm hoping that you will join me. Will you stand? Let's worship him for his greatness.
stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Waymaker, miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness My God, that is who you are That miracle worker, that light in the darkness, that promise keeper, he cares about me and he cares about you. He wraps all of us in his arms and he comforts us. this morning. Those of you that uh, are here in person watching us online or uh, watching a recording of this, we just thank you for being a part of our worship service this morning. See a couple of pictures up there. We congratulate the uh, Triton basketball team who won the sectional last night. Um, Connor is a part of that, so Connor, congratulations. I also want to make mention that um, Haley, where's Haley at? Is she in here right now? No, she's not. 
she's a cheerleader for the Grace um, College basketball team. And uh, their men's basketball team uh, also won their tournament this week. So congratulations, uh, Haley. And hopefully she gets to travel um, at some point in time in the next couple of weeks. If you take out your bulletins, uh, let's just look at some of the things that are happening in the life of the church. Um, again, church console will be on March 28th at 7 p.m. That's uh, uh, a Monday or a week later than it normally is. Um, Monday or the week that it was supposed to be the 21st is part of a spring break for the local community. So uh, we decided and touched the appropriate people um, and we're going to push it back to the 28th. So just get that on your calendars. That is a, ch a change. Um, again, if you have offerings to um, give, they can be uh, given in uh, back in the box on the round table, sent to the church or given online and you see our uh, website up there on the screen. If you're interested in being baptized, um, touch base with Pastor Roger so we can plan that service and he can get a, an idea who might have interest in that. Uh, just a reminder that upper room devotionals are available back in the foyer for you. They are free of charge and uh, if you would like one, feel free to take that. Um, just a note there from World Missionary Press who would like to thank us for our participation in their work. And just a reminder that uh, Tuesday is Ladies' Aid from 9 to 3 here in the Fellowship Hall. And some of the things that will be happening there. Also a note, uh, Pastor Rogers' office hours are generally 9 to 2 Monday through Thursday. But you'll take a note there that he is going to be out of the office on Wednesday morning. So again, if you'd like to reach out to him and need to touch base with him, give him a call or a shout out, uh, social media, whatever. And he's always more than willing to touch base with you and uh, meet with you and talk to you. Anyone else have anything this morning in the way of an announcement that they would like to share with us? Okay, seeing none, Addie, if you would come forward, please. Ephesians 4.29, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Ephesians 4.29. Thank you, Addison. We appreciate, appreciate that very much. This time I'm going to ask Pastor Roger to come forward for our prayer time. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Addie, for your verse this morning. Appreciate that. Um, just a, a couple reminders of uh, the things that have happened in the last uh, week or two here um, and our prayer uh, needs and concerns. Um, we've been praying for the Kaufman family, Glenn and Eunice, uh, with Ashley's passing, um, the Heckman family with Peely's passing, um, and then uh, the Large and Hendricks fa family with Corky's passing. Um, so those three families, we've been praying for them. And then Larry Gokenauer, we've been praying for him as he's been um, getting treatments for pancreatic cancer, um, praying for Sadie Barber, um, as she's going to be having brain surgery soon. And then also Karen West is scheduled to have uh, surgery on March 17th as well. Um, those were the requests that I had, just as reminders, anyone else want to mention any praises or prayer requests? Yeah, Brian. Yeah, I'd like to ask a prayer for my mother, Carolyn Thompson. She's developed pneumonia. Hmm. You said pneumonia? Okay. Brian asked prayer for Shirley um, as she's developed pneumonia. So be in prayer for her. Anyone else want to mention anything? Yeah. Update on Sadie. She has, she has had the surgery. Oh, okay. Good. Anyone else want to mention anything this morning? All right, let's spend some time in prayer. Our gracious, kind, loving, wise, all-knowing Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, for 
just the opportunities we have to come and worship you, the opportunity we have to gather together as your body, the church, to share our gifts with one another, to lift up our voices in singing, to praise your name. God, I just thank you for this church. Father, for uh, the requests. God, for those who have a sorrowful heart this morning, sadness because of um, just the deaths in our community of loved ones and friends. God, we pray that you would be helping to bring comfort. God, helping to bring your peace as the peace we would seek from the world will not satisfy. God, would you just overflow your comfort to those who need it in the midst of their grief, in the midst of their loss. Father, for Larry Gokenauer, I pray that you would be working in his treatments for pancreatic cancer. God, that you would continue to affect his life. God, for Sadie, we thank you for her surgery and that things went well. We pray for healing for her. We pray for Karen and her upcoming surgery, that you would be working in uh, the midst of all those details that you know so clearly, God, and pray that you would work to remove those either by your own hand and miraculous touch or through surgeon's hands. God, you use many instruments. And so, Father, we pray that you would be working in the midst of each of those situations. Father, we pray for Shirley. And God, as she has pneumonia right now, we pray that you would um, help heal her body. God, give her the rest she needs. Allow uh, medications and other things to affect in such a way that um, it can get her body back to um, where it was before. Father, we pray for her healing as well. God, we lift up our missionaries for Ryan Williamson, for Chris Howell, for the Ulmer family is there in Peru. God, we pray that you would be um, helping work there. For other missions we support, for Haiti um, as they're seeking to do medical work there. God, that you would be working in the midst of um, that mission as well. Father, we pray that we would support our missionaries through prayers, through giving, through just our involvement in each of their lives. Father, for our church family, that we would continue to share love to this community, God, through our words and our actions, and God, may that love draw this community, those who don't know you, into a saving relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday, Pastor Roger and Stacy um, sang for us a song called His Mercy is More. And I confess to them that I couldn't help but sing along with the song. Today, we want to invite you to sing along.
Thank you, Cindy, and the praise team. Children can be dismissed. Also, Bible memory can be dismissed for your lessons as well. Forgot to mention my technology, guys. There is a video in this. Um, so there will be some sound, but it's later on near the end of the sermon there. Now you all have a heads up. You all know what's going to happen. <laughs> this year we're focusing on the heart, and through this series we're talking specifically about the heart of Christ. Uh, Dane Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, those are available for you out in the foyer area if you haven't grabbed a copy yet. Uh, feel free to grab a copy of your own. They're free of charge. Um, so those are out, out there. Dane Ortland in his book said, said this, made this comment, the heart in biblical terms is not part of who we are, but the center of who we are. Our heart is what defines and directs us. So we're going through this series called The Heart of Christ. As I mentioned last week, I'm going to kind of coincide, go alongside of the book and the material there, but I'm not going to try to replicate or reproduce everything that's in the book, and that's why I, I have those free of charge, and you can read for yourself, because there's a lot, uh, a lot in there, and I would have no way to do that. So, so basically, I'm trying to go along and cover kind of more in depth the passages that he covers in several of those chapters and the ideas he gives there as well. 
Last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30, kind of if there were a theme verse for what we're going to go through, it's this. It says, Jesus' words saying, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus said, I am gentle and lowly in heart. In that passage, Jesus invites, he gives three commands. He says, come, take, and learn. And those who come, those who take, those who are learning from him, he presents himself as gentle and lowly in heart. So, as we continue through, is Jesus' statement that he is gentle and lowly, do we see that played out through his life, or was this just a statement that Jesus said, and then we don't see the reflection of that in his actions? Well, I believe the answer is yes, this statement is played out in Jesus' life over and over and over again. Think with me about a time in your life when your plans changed. Has that ever happened to you? I think if it hasn't happened to you, you're probably like secluded in your house and have, well, your plans would start, probably still change. Um, because they're based on a, a lot of times our, our own errors or our own issues. But have you ever went home and you thought, oh, I'm going to have a quiet evening at home. And then something goes terribly awry. Your basement starts flooding because of the rain that's happening outside. All of a sudden, you go from quiet to chaos. You want to have a nice dinner with your family, and you've prepped a meal, and, and you come home thinking, I'm going to smell a wonderful roast in the crock pot and the smell going through the house, and you open the door, and there's nothing, because you forgot to turn on the crock pot in the morning. Your plans have changed. You were thinking you were going to be meeting a friend for dinner and you get in your car and you start driving and all of a sudden you have a flat tire. Your plans have changed. You get in the car to go somewhere and you're traveling only to meet up with that one person on the road who decides to go five miles slower an hour, the speed limit, than you were going before that. No judgment. Just saying. <laughs> Your plans have now changed, and now you're going to be late for your meeting. How do you respond when your plans have changed? I can tell you I don't always respond the best. Sometimes it's just an internal frustration, but sometimes it comes out and it's an external frustration. Uh, this morning we're going to see Jesus' heart in response to his plans changing. We're going to start reading in Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 1. The first part of this, 1 through 12, is to kind of just set the scene, to get you guys an idea of what's happening, because it plays a role in the next text. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Now, Matthew's going to do a little bunny trail here, and he's going to tell us about what happened with John and, and Herod and all of the details, but we're going to come back and we're going to focus on those two verses just because that's the context, is Herod and his idea that John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. Verse 3, for Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. So he was in a relationship that he shouldn't have been in, and John was condemning it, and, and so he put John in prison. 
And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people. This is back to Herod wanting to put John to death because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist, detached from his body, uh, here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Now, what kind of a gift does a girl ask for the head of somebody on a platter? This does not, but it, apparently it was a thing. Um, and his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Now, when we get to verse 13, we hear, now, when Jesus heard this, and immediately our minds want to go back to verse 12 that he's hearing of John the Baptist's death. But John the Baptist's death, according to theologians, probably happened months prior to this. What he's going back to hearing is about Herod believing that Jesus is John the Baptist raised from the dead. That's his response there. So that was to give you guys the context of what Jesus heard and what he's going to do. Now, verse 13. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When they went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the loaves and the, the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and, and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples and his disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied and they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides the women and the children. This story is also found in the other three Gospels, Mark, Luke, and John. And so there are parallel versions that give us a little bit more details in each of these. I want to take us to Mark chapter 6, it's going to be up on the screen there, hopefully, if it decides to go. There we go. Mark 6, it says, when he went ashore, this is the same story. Jesus was on the boat. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. In Luke, Luke says, when the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed him. That compassionate spirit was welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. See, Jesus says, tells his disciples, let's get on a boat, let's spend some time alone. Jesus would often go and spend time in solitude. The Bible tells us he would go up onto a mountain and he would spend time praying there, talking to his heavenly father. He's feeling that need because of the pressures of society, because of what Herod is now thinking of him. And, and he's trying to reconnect with his father. And he says, let's go get some time alone. Let's go to a desolate place. And what happens is the people begin to follow Jesus. He's in a boat, but they can see him from the shore. And they're like, he's going to this place. So they're running along the shore to get there. And, and one of the texts, actually in John chapter 6, I believe, it tells us that the people ran along the shore and got there before Jesus and his disciples did. So they're in a hurry. They're seeing what Jesus can do, and they're wanting to get there. And so Jesus gets on shore I'm sure even before that, he's seeing the people and going, all right, well, I had plans to have solitude time. And so the Bible says Jesus responded and he responded in anger. No, no, that's not what it says. It said he responded in frustration. No, it says Jesus responded in complaining. 
No. Jesus responded with compassion. All of those other things are our sinful responses, the way that we tend to respond to these changes in our plans, these life situations that happened. But our gentle and lowly Savior responds with compassion. Now, the idea of compassion, the, the word there actually has this idea behind it of our gut feelings. Uh, compassion was something that was inside. It, it was a, almost, we call it a gut response or a stomach response. But it's a response in, to a need either known or unknown by those needing compassion. So those who were there, Jesus saw them. He saw that they had needs. There were many needs among the people. And Jesus begins addressing those needs. So what does Jesus' compassion impact in all of those lives and the people that he comes to shore and all of a sudden there's this multitude. By the end we learn there's probably 10,000 people there because it's men, women, and children. What is Jesus... What is the impact of Jesus' compassion on these people? First, his compassion impacted their minds. Back in the verse in Mark 6.34, it said that he began to teach them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Well, what about all their shepherds? Right? They had Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes. And what about all those who were supposed to be being their shepherds? The problem was even those religious leaders were leading them to do external practices rather than an internal change of their heart. John Phillips, in his commentary, makes this statement. The Lord was not irritated over the fact that they had broken in on his seclusion. He did not tell the multitude to go home and leave him alone. He embraced them in the arms of love. There were poor lost sheep, and their scribes and rabbis were no shepherds. These shepherds, God had told the prophet Ezekiel to address back in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, it's going to be Ezekiel 34, starting in verse 1. This is what Ezekiel was told by, by God to write down. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones. But you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. You hear the frustration of God with his shepherds that he put in place to guard and protect and feed the flock? He says this in verse 7. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, 
But my shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep, which they weren't doing. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. God rebukes the shepherds here for what, for their practices that they were doing. Because they were getting fat off the sheep. They were not feeding the sheep. They were not caring for the sheep. And we're not talking of a fold here of actual sheep. We're talking of God's people, the nation of Israel. Those he had put in charge were not doing their duty that God had given them. But rather than being like these wicked shepherds, Jesus comes to preach the good news. He doesn't come and preach it even to the high and exalted, but he comes to preach it to the poor. He comes to preach it to the sinners. He comes to preach it to the lowly. John the Baptist, when he was still alive, he sent messengers to Jesus to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come? Even though when John was baptizing Jesus, he proclaimed, behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. But John is questioning now because he's in prison. This is before he was killed. And he's wondering, are you the Messiah? And Jesus responds with these words, Matthew 11, verses 4 and 5. Jesus answered them, this is John's disciples, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. That was a sign to John that Jesus is the Messiah. He came and fulfilled all of these things. The true shepherd had come to show compassion to the sheep rather than to abuse the sheep. Jesus made this statement in John chapter 10. He said, I am the good shepherd. I came to take advantage of my sheep. No, that's not what he said. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That is what God had called these Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees, all the religious leaders, to be good shepherds to his people, to place their welfare, the welfare of the peoples, above their own, and yet they didn't do that. So Jesus comes and says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So his compassions impacted their minds. We have an opportunity to show compassion in how we teach others, how we proclaim the word of God. Paul writes this in the book of Ephesians. He says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is ahead, into Christ. Speaking the truth in love. Sometimes I struggle with that. Sometimes I like to speak the truth, but I forget about the love part. I forget I need to speak the truth in love. Why? Because the truth can be really harsh sometimes. It can be blunt. So Paul proclaims, speak the truth in love. Jesus had compassion and he begins teaching them. His compassion impacted their minds His compassion also impacted their struggles. In Luke, we saw, Luke 9, 11, it said, When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God. He taught them and cured those who had need of healing. 
Verse 14 of our text, Matthew 14, it says, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and he began to heal their sick. His compassion impacted all of their struggles. Jesus' statement that he has a heart that is gentle and lowly. It is shown through his compassion. And it's not just this instance. There's multiple times through the Gospels, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where we read about Jesus having compassion on those who needed healing, who were sinners. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 and 41 And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. And moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand, and he touched him and said to him, I will be clean. That word pity there, just another word for compassion. It's the same root word, the word compassion there. Moved with compassion, moved with pity. He stretched out his hand, and he touched him. He said, I will be clean. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus is arriving at a town called Nain, and there's a funeral procession happening. There's a woman who lost her only son, and we also find out in the text that she's a widow, and so she's left with no one. And she's grieving this son that has just recently died. Jesus comes on the scene and he begins to see everything that's happening. It says this in Luke chapter 7 verse 13. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion. Everybody say compassion. Compassion. He had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. What do you mean don't weep, Jesus? My son just died. My husband's already died. I've lost everyone. What do you mean do not weep? What, are her, what, is, what is his next words? Then he came up and he touched the, the beer, which that's the, the like, structure that the, the casket is on. And the bearers stood still. And so they're moving this along and he comes up and just touches it. And he said, young man... I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. He had compassion. He saw the crowd that had interrupted his plans and he had compassion. He sees a leper. He has compassion. He sees this woman who's just lost everything. He has compassion. Time and time again, Jesus is demonstrating compassion in each of these situations. Not only did he demonstrate it, but he talked about it too. You guys probably remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. There's a man who's walking down the road and he begins to fall into a, a trouble with some thieves. They come and they beat him and they take his possessions and they leave him for dead. And Jesus tells this story and says, well, there was a man, a priest traveling along and he saw the man who was beaten and left for dead, but he avoided him and goes around, takes the farthest route around as he can. Same way, likewise, Jesus said, a Levite was traveling and and everybody, the audience there listening to this parable, to Jesus' story, they're thinking, oh, well, the priest didn't do it. Okay, I understand. If he touches him, he's unclean. Okay, I get this. Then a Levite come along. Oh, a Levite. A Levite surely will help, right? But Jesus says that the Levite also went around. And then Jesus says a Samaritan, and the audience of that time hated Samaritans. and So they're all like, well, of course the Samaritans aren't going to touch this Jewish person at all. Where's Jesus going with this? I don't have any idea, but the Samaritan's going to even go farther outside if he can. He's going to avoid him completely. But Jesus says the Samaritan came to him. 
Luke chapter 10, verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He had compassion. Jesus continues and says that Samaritan poured oil on his wounds, bandaged him, put him on his own transportation, his, his donkey or whatever he had there, and he took them to an inn that he had to go because he had some plans, and so he gave money to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, make sure he's all healed up, give him time, and if there's any extra expenses, I will take care of all of those when I return. That is compassion in action. He didn't just have the gut feeling go, I should do something about that, but look at the time, okay, sorry. Because sometimes we can feel the compassion, but the action isn't there. We can ignore the compassion. Jesus said there was a man, a Samaritan, who chose to have compassion and show it in a specific, specific way. So as compassion impacted their minds, it impacted their struggles, it also impacted their physical needs. So they're there, Jesus is teaching and he's healing, and I don't know what that looks like if he's like teaching for a little bit and all of a sudden there's somebody brought up to him, he's like, okay, I'm going to pause here and, you know, heal or, or what's happening exactly, but he's, he's healing the sick. He's meeting these physical needs, but there's another physical need that's starting to arise, You're starting to feel it, the hunger. They're starting to sense and the disciples are probably, they were, I don't know what their plans were for the day, but I don't think they've eaten much probably because they were traveling across the lake and then all of this is happening and they're starting to feel it and they're like, Jesus, um, we all got together and we think you probably should send these people to go get some food because... We had some plans, and we were going to have some solitude time, and yeah, you'd said maybe we'd do some fasting at some point, but I'm just, we need to eat. It's getting late. What's Jesus' response? There's humor in the scriptures. Verse 16, Jesus said, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Jesus, we just said, we all got together, we'd have a conversation, we think you should send them away. <laughs> no, they said, okay. So, they did a little research. They said, of all the 5,000 people, 10,000, if you count everybody, we found five loaves and two little fish. Now, these probably weren't like Italian loaf loaves. These were probably like loaves. Two little, like five little small loaves. The fish probably weren't like the catch of the day. They were probably like fish. Some commentaries I read said the, the fish could have just been like sardines. They could have been just small, just enough protein to get you through the rest of the day. See, the disciples are sensing a supply and demand problem. There's a lot of demand, but there's a little supply. John chapter 6 tells us that these are barley loaves. It's interesting to note that those are... The bread, barley, bread, and fish were just a simple, basic, Galilean peasant meal. It, was just, it wasn't lobster and steak here. It was what they needed, just basic food. They looked at their supply of five loaves and two fish and 
The idea of feeding this size crowd with that seemed impossible to the disciples. It was barely enough, as you read through the different ones, it was a young boy who presented this. It was barely enough probably for him. Maybe he was going to share with his brothers and sisters, we don't know. Jesus calmly quiets the crowd, has them sit down, and he begins passing out. So as he broke, he said a prayer and he begins to break the food, give it to the disciples, and the disciples need start passing it around. And all of a sudden, more and more and more and more and more. It was already late. I don't know how long the process took for 12 disciples to get food out to 10,000 people, but it started going pretty quick. They began to pass the food around. People begin to get their fill. They begin to get enough and say, nope, no more. We've got, our group has enough. One of the texts said they were seated in 50s and 100s. Oh, no, uh, we have enough. We're good. Take it to the next group. Nope, we have enough. We're good. All of a sudden, everybody's full from five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, let's not waste anything. Let's be good stewards of what God has just done here and collect it. So they take the baskets they had. I would lean towards these are probably not baskets in the stories, like the kids' stories. They, they show baskets. Well, where did they get baskets? They just come across the lake. I don't think they had baskets. But quite often, they had a basket that they carried with them that they kept the supplies and they need. They got 12 baskets full. He told the disciples, collect the leftovers. Who collected the leftovers? The disciples. How many disciples were there? Twelve. How many baskets full of leftovers did they collect? Twelve. See, I think Jesus was not just supplying for the disciples' right now need. He got everybody's right now need. But he said, I'm going to supply some for you for later. I'm going to give you a reminder of what just happened here. So that when you get up in the morning... You have something to eat. This text tells us immediately after all of this, verse 22, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. He sends them away and Jesus goes and has solitude time. But what happened? The wind is against them. The boat is trying to get to the other side, but it's not happening. It's being beaten against the waves. Verse 25, and Jesus came to them walking on the sea. It says the disciples were terrified. They proclaimed it's a ghost. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you and Peter begins to step out and walk on the water. We know that he got distracted by everything that was going around, the wind and the waves, and so he begins to go down, and Jesus rescues him and gets him back on the boat. It says when Jesus got on the boat, the wind ceased. Everything died down. All while I think they had a reminder of what God had done for them. And yet they were afraid, yet they didn't know what was going to happen. I think Jesus' heart of compassion reaches out to meet the needs of the whole person. For Jesus, it wasn't just about meeting a physical need or a mental need with teaching them or or healing them. It wasn't even about just a spiritual need. He, He came and he ministered to the whole person. When he has compassion on them, his compassion flows into each of those areas. 
What is compassion? Compassion is helping your brother in need. When Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, that was what the question was. Who is my neighbor? Who am I supposed to show that kind of love to? It was the Samaritan who showed love to the other person. The Brownlee brothers in 2016 were racing the World Triathlon in Cozumel, Mexico. It was a hot day. And John, Johnny Brownlee was going to win the triathlon. He was within a few hundred meters of the end. But his body began to give out. His brother Alistair was in the same race, but a few people back. Alistair had an opportunity to win the race, but he stops and helps his brother. You're going to see it in this video clip. Got the sound back there? This is Johnny, and he's just, he can't do anymore. Here comes his brother. We're not stopping here. So they continue on arm in arm. Johnny's just being dragged along at this point. And okay, I'm done. Do you notice he let his brother go first? That's compassion, helping those who have a need. So what are the responses we can have as we hear about Jesus' compassion? First, we can recognize the compassion he shows us in the midst of our struggles and sinfulness. I think there's this mindset, at least I know I've had this mindset before, that because I sin or because I do something wrong, that God is going to zap me or he's going to punish me or there's going to be this thing that happens big in my life. And I think after reading this book, it, it changed that. Yes, there are times when God does choose to discipline his children But the heart of Jesus, reflecting the heart of God, is so often in compassion. And if God is going to discipline, he's going to do it through compassion. It doesn't say the very heart of God is anger, but rather the very heart of God is compassion. And so the things that God does is through a heart of compassion. And so just recognizing that God is showing compassion to us in the midst of our struggles and sinfulness. Dane Ortland said this, the cumulative testimony of the four gospels, all of the gospels together, is that when Jesus Christ sees the fallenness of the world all about him, his deepest impulse, his most natural instinct is to move toward that sin and suffering, not away from it. He says this as well, but the dominant note left ringing in our ears after reading the Gospels, the most vivid and arresting element of the portrait is the way the Holy Son of God moves toward, touches, heals, embraces, and forgives those who least deserve it, yet truly desire it. Who are those who least deserve it? I'm one of those. And yet he moves toward, heals, embraces in each of those situations. Secondly, oh, in Colossians chapter 3, it says this, Put on then as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. What is... 
Paul communicating here? We're holy and beloved. Put on then first compassionate hearts. Huh, I'm missing a slide in there. The second one is that we can echo Jesus' compassion to others. We can echo Jesus' compassion to others. So that flow of compassion coming to us can be shown to others as well. I think compassion begins with having a sensitivity to human needs. What are the physical needs? What are the mental, the, the things that need to be taught? What are the spiritual needs? And then addressing those, having compassion having compassion in our neighborhoods, having compassion in our families at home, having compassion in our churches. I think all of these are part of how God calls us to display His compassion, His compassionate heart to those who need to hear it. Father, I thank You for Your compassionate heart, a heart that moves towards sinners, a heart that doesn't shy away from the poor. God, a heart that doesn't shy away from the awkward. God, a heart that doesn't shy away from those who are smelly. God, a heart that doesn't shy away from those who are depressed. God, a heart that does not shy away from those who are lost and wicked. But you see the multitude and you have compassion. Help us, God, to reflect your compassionate heart in our lives as well. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we close that song, His Mercy is More, His Compassion. situations in each of your life. Have a great week. God bless.